I'm going to ask a question. I don't know if you can be honest or not. Hopefully, after I answer the question, you'll decide that. If you had to rate how well you're doing as a Christian between an A plus and an F, where would you put yourself? This morning, I'm, um, I've got brain blockage, um, cognitive constipation, <laughs> mind mastication, uh, reasoning roadblocks, because the more I studied and looked at this story of Esther, I kept coming back to what I talked about last time, because I didn't feel... I didn't feel like I got what I wanted to get across. Across, that's my problem. Problem is, that's that's my problem. <laughs> and it's when I'm reviewing and looking at things, I, I I start feeling the weight of these stories. And a lot of times, if I'm struggling to understand something or struggling to to put it into practice, it, it I stop. It it stops me. And um, I recognize that I'm a clay vessel, and I came across this amazing poem about clay vessels and the spirituality of of what it means when we're studying this. You might recognize this one. I'm a little teapot, short and stout. Here's my handle. Here's my spout. When I get all steamed up, hear me shout. Tip me over and pour me out. I'm a very special pot. This is true. Here's an example of what I can do. I can just change my hand when my spout tip me over and pour me out. Now, that's not a theological statement, but sometimes that's what we feel like. Yes, God talks to all of us, but many times we feel tipped over and just poured out. This story is a complex story. There's a lot of it that I just want to scream at God and saying, how dare you do this to somebody? It's an ugly story. And the other side of me is going, but we have to trust God in the story. But then I go back to the other side, but how could you dare do this to a young girl? Because there's two very complex things that are happening through the book of Esther. One is an immense amount of pain. The other side is God's redemptive story. But it's easy for us to focus on God's redemption because we have hindsight. We look back on and understand it. It's hard for us to look at it when it happened and as if it happened. So to help us, I want us to take a quick review just to bring these stories back into context context for us this morning to help us focus and, and remember this story. We remember the story of Darius, Darius I, the father of Xerxes in this story. He's having issues in the Ionian states with the Athenians in Greece, creating an uproar on the eastern, uh, western side of Turkey, so he goes to squelch this revolt with about a million people, marches across, and comes to into conflict in Greece itself. And just to understand what's happening in the Greek states, the Athenian Empire at Athens, right now this is the pinnacle of the Athenian Empire. They're building things that you would know like the Acropolis. Um, This is the, the, the thrust of the civilization, and now the Persian Empire and the Athenian Empire are coming together. And we talked about it last time at the Battle of Marathon. Late in the year, the Battle Marathon is happening, and to try to raise support, we know the marathon that happened, a guy runs south to talk to um, the Spartans to try to engage them in the war, wasn't able to do that. He runs about 200 miles and then finally gets there, and the Athenians are winning. He says now that they are, are winning and falls over dead, and that's where we get the concept of the marathon. History writes this man has the name of Pheidippides. Um, it's questionable whether he did this or not. Um, now, Darius, the father, 
is licking his wounds back in the Persian Empire around Susa and Babylon, trying to get together his troops again to go back and destroy the Greeks. In the meantime, the Egyptians hear about how these Athenians actually beat the Persians back with a very small number of troops. So the Egyptians come up in an uprising, and he starts to go after the Egyptians and is killed in the process and dies. So now Xerxes, the son, comes to power with a big chip on his shoulder. That's Esther chapter 1. Esther chapter 1 is Xerxes having this massive banquet to try to bring all the princes of, of his empire together to generate support, to say, hey, dad didn't know what he was doing. I'm the better version of dad. We're going to go back and defeat the Greeks. Pulls everybody together in this, this six-month banquet to do this. In the process, his wife, um, Vashti, doesn't want to do what he wants her to do, so he kicks her out. Um, and it's probably one of the major mistakes why he lost the war. History talks about it. But now he is trying to figure out how to beat these Greeks. Herodotus, the Greek historian, writes all about this. It's like a, a novel you would read today. Try to find it and read it. So Xerxes now gets an army of about a million people and marches to Greece to try to destroy these Athenians. He runs into a problem. He realized that the reason why his dad lost was because he couldn't get his troops into battle fast enough. He couldn't get them across the islands fast enough to defeat the Greeks because of just the terrain of how the Greek mountains are. So he comes up with a brilliant concept. He builds a ship bridge about three quarters of a mile to try to get his troops into battle faster. It's one of the first, if not the first, floating bridges ever created. He is investing everything into this Greek, in conquering the Greeks. But we know the story. Here in the plain along the sea, a group of 300 Spartans come up against him. And because it's a very narrow area, we're not sure how narrow, probably only 100 feet, 150 feet between the, the sea and the mountain ridge. So a very small group of archers hold off a million Persians. And once again, the Persians are suffering defeat. Something else happens. One of the Persians flips sides and tell, or this, one of the Spartans flips sides and tells Xerxes, if you go around the mountain, you can get behind him and conquer. But in the process, he loses. Um, the Athenians retreat, and they lose in the, in the battles in the sea. And now Xerxes is back home in Susa. He's lost his queen. He's lost his quest. Just like his dad, he is defeated. This begins Esther chapter 2. So when you read Esther chapter 2, it says, after these things. What things? Chapter 1 starts out by after these things. Dad lost the war. He's trying to generate an army to go fight the Greeks again. Chapter 2 starts by saying, after these things, Xerxes is back, lost the war. This is the, the biggest battles in world history ever beginning Esther chapter 2. And then said the... See, I want us to look at what happens when pain comes into a life of an unbeliever. Because when pain enters a life of an unbeliever, they do certain things that a believer wouldn't do. One of the very first things that unbelievers do is they turn to selfish means. If something bad happens, they turn internalize and try to deal with, with selfish means. They try to deal with it with, with something new or exciting stimulations to, to try to, to appease the pain because they don't trust God. They have to create outside um, ideas or, or issues to try to appease the pain inside. So it shows up like, okay, I can't fix this problem, so let's go shopping. Us sevens understand this concept very well. Um, shiny new objects are amazing things. It's great therapy. Run away from problems. It's, it's, it... so, sometimes it's not even go shopping. Sometimes it's, it's I, I don't know how to deal with this problem, so let's eat chocolate. <laughs> But when we don't trust the story or when we have a, a, a wrong concept of what is happening, we try to solve it or appease the problem through outside means. So now this man has lost his first wife, Vashti. He's lost his quest. Listen to what they tell him. Then send the king's service, servants. 
but that's big enough we're going to read. Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, let there be fair young virgins sought for the king, a distraction. And the king appointed officers in all the provinces of his kingdoms that they may gather together all the fair young virgins unto Shushan the palace to the house of the woman and let their purification be started. And let the maiden which pleaseth the king be queen instead of Vashti. Now, if you understand this, they're just saying, okay, just bring the young virgins. You know, we want to want to distract the king. And the reason why we're going to select the king, queen, is because she's beautiful and she knows how to, to, to um, have relations with the king. That is, that is the qualifications of this entire situation that's happening, because the, the physical beauty and, and sensual training is, is the most important thing in selecting a queen. This is the introduction of Esther. Now you can understand why this book really struggled to get into the biblical canon. Um, it almost didn't make it almost in every single council or every single decision that's happening. Esther was one of the last ones to be decided upon. Most of the time, and, and if you start studying the commentaries or um, all the, the learned writings about this, most of them put it into a comedy or some sort of drama. Almost every book I've read on these topics don't even view it as being a real story. Because it's so, it's so far out that how could God redeem this person? Or, or this, this is way too fast. I was reading a Jewish commentary. It's one of the ones that's sanctioned by the rabbis. And they just dismiss it as a story that they wrote around the turn of the century as a, as a comedy. But something is going on here. There's bigger reasons that, that are happening here. And when you read this story, it talks about in Shushan, the palace, there's a Jew named Mordecai, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Now, when you hear the word Kish, not the food, when you hear the word Kish, who comes to mind? Saul, why? Kish is his dad. So right away we're picking up on a story. We have to realize that this story is bigger than we can ever imagine. This story goes back long before Esther is even, even conceived. This goes back to the story of Saul. What was Saul's part in the story? Because when we start looking at this, we now understand they're carried away from Jerusalem with this captivity. Fine, I'll let my mind distract myself. This story is far bigger. How many years did it take for this story to take place? Why did this story even have to take place? Saul didn't do what he was supposed to do. But that's not the problem as much either. What was supposed to happen when the time of Moses and the children of Israel? When Moses is coming out of, of Egypt with the children of Israel, they are um, just entering into the promised land, and the Amalekites attack. We often wonder why God used lethal force in the Old Testament. We talk about how can he destroy people groups. Understand there's big stories happening here. Why did God tell Moses to wipe the Amalekites off the earth? What did they do? Who did they attack? Remember the story of Moses raises his hand, they're in victory, his hands get tired, they do, get defeated. That's the story. But who did the Amalekites first attack? The end of the column. The poor, the weak, the elderly. The ones that were already hurting, the Amalekites came up. And in anger, it says in, in, in almost like a, a, a rage, destroyed the poor and the weak and the needy. You want to get God's attention. Go after that. And God says, no. These are rageful people that attack the weak. And God says, wipe them off the earth. You'll see that language pop up over and over in the story. Saul is the one that ends up doing it. Samuel comes to Saul and says, hey, wipe them off the earth. And Saul says, all righty, he does it. And Saul's like, okay. Samuel comes before him and says, okay, what's happened? He's like, did you destroy them all? He's like, yep, I destroyed them all. And Samuel's like, well, what's that? sheep I hear over on that hill. 
It's like, well, I kept the best of them. Oh, and the king. What's the king's name? Agag. So between the time that Saul doesn't kill Agag and Samuel has to do it, there's a son. And the Agagites begin. Now you start seeing the framework of what's happening in this story. So we have the son of Kish, the Benjamite, are now carried away from Jerusalem into captivity. We talked about the pain of an unbeliever, but let's look at the pain of Esther. She lost her home. She's now not in the homeland of Israel. She lost her national honor. She lost her parents. She even loses her name. We call her Esther, Ishtar. You know what Ishtar means? The goddess of love, sensuality, sex, desire. And now she lost her freedom. See, Hadassah means righteous. I love digging into these stories because you're like, well, how can God do this? Because then you begin to think, well, how could Esther or Hadassah even do this? But then you say, did she have a choice? Did she have any means to stop what's happening? Could she have stopped the Babylonian Empire for carrying her people away? Could she stop her parents from dying? But I love, it literally means myrtle in Hebrew, and myrtle just means a, a calming, a, a, um, it's almost a simple, but a, a plain just righteousness. And here's this girl now that has lost everything, and now has lost even her name, her identity itself has been completely violated. I, I can't understand the, the agony that would be in a young girl that now has lost that much. There's a very few people that would, could, could say, I've lost all of that. So it came to pass, the king's command and his decree was heard, that many maidens were gathered together in the Shushan, the palace, and Esther was brought into the king's house. And the maiden pleased him, and she obtained kindness of him. And he speedily gave her things for purification, which such things as belonged to her, and seven maidens which were meet to uh, be given her out of the king's house. And he preferred her and her maids unto the best place of the house of the women. Esther had not showed her people, nor her kindred, for Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it or tell it. And Mordecai walked every day before the court of the woman's house and know how Esther did and what should become of her. One thing that's just been running in my head with this story, if you're a Mordecai and you know there's a Hadassah in the palace, make sure you walk by every day. It's so easy for us to look at the world and pain and people and go, okay. But every day, every day, he says, God, I know you put her in my charge. Every day, how are you doing? Are you okay? This to me is one of the favorite lines in this entire story. If you want to look what righteousness looks like, right here. Every single day. How are you doing? Maybe she couldn't even show up, but she's looking out her window and go, today again? Every single day. Because he knows she has no choices. She has nothing that she can control. I mentioned this last time, but God knows what pain is. John Stotts writes this. I could never myself believe in God if it were not for the cross. 
The only God I believe in is the one that Nietzsche ridiculed as God on the cross. In the real world, real world of pain, how could one worship a God who was immune to it? I have entered into many Buddhist temples in different Asian countries and stood respectfully before the statue of Buddha, his legs crossed, arms folded, eyes closed, the ghost of a smile playing around his mouth, a remote look on his face, detached from the agonies of the world. But each time, after a while, I have had to turn away, and in imagination I have turned instead to that lonely, twisted, tortured figure on the cross, nails through hands and feet, back lacerated, limbs wrenched, brow bleeding from the thorn pricks, mouth dry and intolerably thirsty, plunged in God-forsaken darkness. That is the God for me. He laid aside his immunity to pain. He entered our world of flesh and blood and tears and death. He suffered for us. Our sufferings become more manageable in the light of his. There is still a question mark against human suffering, but over it we boldly stamp another mark, the cross that symbolizes divine suffering. The cross of Christ is God's only self-justification in such a world as ours. The other gods were strong, but thou wast weak. They rode, but thou didst stumble to a throne. But to our wounds only God's wounds can speak. And not a God has wounds, but thou alone. I heard a discussion talking about if Christ is the face of God, what a benevolent face. Oft times, our view of God is a deistic one. It actually is a descendant of the, the belief of Zeus standing off on the mountain, thunder and lightning in one hand, justice in, in his eyes. But that's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible shows up in the person of Christ. Do you view God as Christ? Where he's here to give sight to the blind, heal the sick, care for the needy, wrap his arms around the leper, sit across the table with sinners. That's a benevolent face. Even Genesis chapter 1, do you read Genesis chapter 1 as a view of God? And he looked at everything and said, that's good. He didn't say, perfect. He says, but that's good. Do we have the same view of that? Do we look at the world and say, that's good? In our relationship with God... How we interact with him is completely based on how we view him. If we view God as a vengeful or unjust deity, we will act that way. If you see him as cruel, you will view the world that way. If we see God as a loving, tender, forgiving, unselfish God, we will slowly imitate that. I ask at the beginning, how would you rate your Christianity? In your living out your Christianity, do you doubt that God is good in everything? God is good. Do you live a life where God is good in your day-to-day -day operation? Do you look at the mirror? and say, God is good? Do you look out your window and say, God is good? If you think and believe that God is good, then he has to be doing things for a purpose. If he's good, he's not going to let chaos reign. If he's good, there must be a purpose no matter how it looks to us, there has to be a purpose. So if God is good, we have to wait to a final conclusion to understand his purpose. The problem is, we don't always get to see it. Life is tough. Oft times we then say, well, we must be just chess pieces to be tossed about. 
No, he says that all things work together for good to the love of God. I think the beauty of heaven is going to be able to sit down and say, okay, God, just show me. Okay, this thing, this situation I was in, all right, what good was flat tire on a Monday? And I think he's going to go, let me show you something and walk you through it. Do you realize that it took 800 years, let me do the math, 600 years for the Amalekites to Saul, another 500 years Saul to Esther? Esther is sitting there going, I have no idea what's going on here much. What am, I, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to live in this situation? But we have to understand that the only reason that Esther could play a part is because she just lost everything. She's only now in the room with the king because everything had been taken. It's hard to be a big player or a big role in God's story by refusing to live the life that he has you living. So do we want to accept this position that God has put us in, or are we going to fight and kick and scream against God and say, how dare you? If you would ask this question of, of Esther, if we could have a, a news crew show up outside the palace and say, okay, Esther, um, we saw that you've uh, been selected now for the queen, um, or before this, the, the king's um, call girl here. Um, what, what are you thinking? How are you feeling? Is it going to be excruciating pain? Is she confused? I don't know what I'm doing here. Is she broken? A year training to, to pleasure a king? That's got to be fun. Is she scared? Is she feeling inadequate? Does she want to run away? Does she want to die? Is it hope? I think you'd see a, a, a girl in deep pain longing for home, longing for parents. There's a few things that she begins to do that I, I, I love. It says when, she, when, they, when the turn of Esther was come to go into the king, she required nothing but what Haggai, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the woman, appointed. This is a verse of hope for me that I struggle with this story. She didn't embrace the situation. 